Hello, everybody. We're here to have me answer your questions. We've had hundreds come in, but I want to start off with uh, Margaret Elizabeth, who is the co-chair of the National Green Lavender Caucus, to talk about transgender issues and have a conversation uh, to get some of these issues clarified. So, Margaret, how are you doing? I'm good, Howie. Thanks for having me on tonight. How are you today? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Thanks for chatting with us about transgender issues. They're really obviously significantly important. And if one looks around in broader society, you can see that there is a, a groundswell of support for transgender rights. So I think this is a very topical thing. Yeah, groundswell, but also problems we got to address. Uh, well, that's true. There are some problems to address. And I'd like to talk with you about those tonight if we get a chance to. Um, but I, I feel like I have a bit of an obligation <laughs> to my community to ask you a few questions. And and, I, and I'm going to be as honest with these as I can. And I hope that uh, you can be as straightforward with us as you can be as well. Sure. So, <clears throat> Howie, you probably are aware that there, the Primo Nutmeg interview is making a lot of rounds. And wherein you uh, dead name Chelsea and misgender her a few times. And I was wondering if you could talk to us and explain... Um, how that situation arose and, and what you've gone through to change your position and, and to evolve your understanding about this kind of thing. Well, that interview is a year old, and I, I misspoke I, by mistake. I'm sorry it happened, and I've apologized. And I'll apologize again. I was, you know, all I can say is I'd been working on Chelsea's case before she transitioned. And, you know, I, I, I said, I used her old name instead of her current name. And I, I, all I can say is I, I've been up since three in the morning. I hadn't eaten. It was like, I was afraid I was gonna miss lunch. And so it was just one of those bad days. So, you know, I just apologize again for that. And I understand, you know, that people want respect and, and uh, you know, I wanna give it, I just, I just put my foot in my mouth that day. Fair enough. I, I make those mistakes too. And I personally think it's really important to, to just step in front of them and own them and apologize and move along. So thank you for that answer. I know it's been a, a significant issue in our community. So I appreciate it. Um, and I kind of wanted to, to, to move our conversation a little bit in a, in a different direction since that's kind of an old thing now. Um, in our, in our current climate and situation, we find ourselves in a in an awkward position where there are some job and workplace and, and housing protections for queer people, and some groups of queer people don't have those. In particular, trans and gender non-conforming people don't have workplace and housing protections. What would a Hawkins presidency look like in regards to enshrining those protections for trans people? Well, first of all, push hard for the passage of the Equality Act is passed the House, is stuck in the Senate, and that's where presidential leadership could not only push that bill, but set a very different tone for the country. And the president, you know, has a platform, and they can uh, promote a uh, a tone of you know tolerance and understanding. So I think that's a big part of it. Now the immediate problem, particularly with this coronavirus crisis, is People need housing and they need employment or income and they need health care. And we don't have the Equality Act now. We have in various states and localities, we do have some inclusion of gender nonconforming people in non discrimination laws, but we don't have them nationally. So I think what we need to be demanding now is that in the implementation of these relief packages, that transgender and non-conforming, gender non-conforming people are included and not discriminated against. And there needs to be emergency housing. Uh, they haven't done this, but there should be vouchers for people that don't have housing so they can get particularly transgender people housing in hotels, motels. Uh, and we can demand this of state governments as well, uh, take over abandoned properties and turn them into housing for this emergency. Um, and then the things we need for a general response to COVID need to be applied without discrimination. And there are things that haven't passed yet, like Ilhan Omar just put in a bill uh, for a moratorium on rent and for uh, mortgage payments. 
with the federal government making those payments so that we don't have a string of bankruptcies for small landlords and credit unions and so forth. That's something we need to get behind, um, but it needs to be implemented without discrimination. $2,000 for every adult and $500 for every child for the duration of the crisis is another one. And, uh, you know, right across the board, the things that we, we need a moratorium or uh, a ban on evictions, uh, foreclosures and utility shutoffs for the duration of this thing. So those general things that ought to be in relief packages should be applied without discrimination to deal with the needs of gender nonconforming people. And then when we get to health care, you know, Medicare, I believe, should cover uh, coronavirus testing, treatment, and all emergency services, and should be applied without discrimination and respecting, you know, the gender identification of people that come for services. So, Howie, that actually takes us to a really interesting place in our discussion, and I'd, I I want to talk to you about your Medicare for All plan, uh, if I can. Um, but I want to bring it maybe in a personal focus. So, as you know, the uh, Lavender Caucus is having an ongoing dispute with the Georgia State Green Party. One of the things that Georgia State proposes is to deny health care to trans people and to gender nonconforming people. And how would a Medicare for All plan, which you advocate for, work when there are aspects of the Green Party who are seeking to deny Medicare for All? Well, I put out a statement as soon as I found out about the position the Georgia Green Party took, urging them to reconsider that I don't believe, as they claimed, that trans rights are in conflict with women's rights. I mean, I think that's false. Um, in terms of how Medicare for All ought to work, it should work without discrimination based on gender identification. Uh, it should have a process where people can register, investigate, or have investigated, and resolve cases of alleged discrimination. And the services, you know, Medicare for All would provide all medically necessary services. It should include surgery and hormone treatment that transgender people want. And that should be an issue between the patients and their doctors. You know, the state should not interfere. It's just like reproductive rights, abortion rights. So, um, as you, <laughs> that's a good answer. Thank you. <laughs> so, as you know, right now, across the United States, there is an inconsistent patchwork of laws with respect to intersex people and forcible surgeries when they're born. Many times, intersex uh, children are subjected to surgeries without their consent. The Lavender Caucus position is that that should never happen. It should always be a consent-based thing between, as you say, patients and their doctors, in this case, the parents and the doctors. How, how would the Hawkins campaign ensure that intersex rights are protected throughout the country? Well, it sounds like we need legislation to protect that right. I agree that you shouldn't be subjecting children who have you know, no ability to, they're not adults, they, they're not of the age of consent and to force surgery upon them is you know, a violation of their basic human rights. I'm glad you agree. <laughs> I, I figured that you would, but it was, it's nice to be able to just say the words. So I guess in a, in a broad sense, if, if I can, that brings us to, the, to a bit of a, the sticky issue that um, we're dealing with right now in the National Party. As you know, and perhaps many of the viewers do, there's an ongoing dispute between the Lavender Caucus and the Georgia State Green Party. One of the, the primary contentions that we have with what Georgia has done is indeed the denial of bodily autonomy to trans people. So that's obviously a position which you agree that people should have bodily autonomy and it should be a position between their, the doctor and the patients. So I was wondering if you could talk uh, perhaps less about the healthcare aspects and more just about the political aspects of this kind of struggle while we're in the midst of a presidential campaign. Well, the Green Party as a whole has been very clear about defending trans rights. And it's unfortunate Georgia did this. And I hope they will participate in the Dispute Resolution Committee of the Green Party, which I know the National Green Lavender Caucus has uh, urged them to do with that mm -hmm. caucus. And I hope the grassroots members of the Georgia Green Party will correct this position they took. I'm 
not it's not clear to me at all that it really reflects the grassroots membership and i think what we need to do is you know organize people to get this uh position changed within georgia i agree i'm a big believer in in organizing around um issues so if i want to change the issue i want to organize it as you know our caucuses has filed formal dispute resolution paperwork so we are asking georgia to come and speak to us in a formal manner about this issue uh, Georgia has indicated so far a, a, a reticence to do so. They seem to believe that they are on the right side of this discussion. In our declaration of justice and reconciliation, we listed a, a series of steps that we thought would be appropriate to address this issue, an apology, a retraction, engagement with us about being educated on transgender health care. Georgia has seemed reticent to do so. We're at a point now where it feels like we're going to be taking this conversation to the broader Green Party and perhaps even putting this to a vote. Um, and that's a, that's a broad consideration for our party. I want to ask you a specific question. So in the social justice pl plank of our party, Section 5.5 says that the Green Party will pursue legislation to uh, seek damages for people who have been the victims of violence and injustice in our community. If the Lavender Caucus and the Georgia Green Party can't work things out, would you support our caucus in a lawsuit against Georgia State? The state of Georgia or the Georgia The Green state of Georgia Green Party. I'm sorry for being a bit okay. imprecise. <laughs> okay. Um, I really hope it doesn't come to that. I think, uh, you know, we still have other steps we can take. Dispute Resolution com uh, Committee. Um, I'm sure there are Greens in Georgia we need to talk to and uh, get them involved who support trans rights. And uh, so I hope we can head that off. You know, Me too. We, we, want a, we want a resolution that we we got an affiliate in Georgia that's with trans rights and carrying our ballot line and doing supporting all the other things that we're for. I'm, I'm a big believer in, in trying to work this out th through the political process. I, I firmly am of the opinion that our opponents just misunderstand the issues and have been miseducated. And if we had an opportunity to present actual science on this, on this subject that we can, we can show where they're wrong. To be honest, it, it doesn't feel that we need to do that. These are already protections which are enshrined for trans people in the Green Party. So... If if any of you are watching and not sure if you should be participating in the Green Party, I'll have you know that this is a good place for trans and gender nonconforming people. We have a, a small outlier of people who, can you say, have progressive views. Well, we, we do have, we have evolved in the Green Party, and I think we're evolving on this issue, and I think we can help the Georgia Green Party evolve. I think that's a broad point to make. Um, so my involvement with the Green Party has been, for the for about five years now. However, I know when I first joined the Green Party, there was, an, in the broader society, a perspective or, or perception of the Green Party, if you will, that it was kind of stuck in the 80s and, and free love and that sort of thing. Perhaps you could uh, speak a bit how, on how the Green Party itself has evolved as a progressive political organization and how your campaign in particular carries forward that progressive view into the future. Well, I think one of the issues we had in the 80s that we have got a lot better on are economic class issues and how we're really for economic justice. Uh, we had a range of people there. You know, when we first started, we ran up the flag and all kinds of people saluted that really didn't agree. And it's it's taken a while to uh, sort that out. Um, so I think the question of capitalism is a system that exploits people. People don't get the full fruit of their labor. That creates inequality, which relates to the economic class issues. It's a system of endless growth, which destroys the planet. I think more and more Greens have come around to that point of view. It's now in our national platform. So uh, we've evolved, and I think we're going to keep evolving on all these issues, as well as the transgender issue. So listen, I'm, I'm supposed to go 30 minutes. We've gone maybe 15. So I really appreciate you bringing these up. You know, I had to yeah. clarify some issues, and uh, I hope it got it clear for people. And absolutely they are important issues. So, thank you. 
Yeah, you're welcome, Howie. Um, you know, I know that in a in a broad sense, it it is let's say um, a new subject for the Green Party to to tackle in a in a general sense, and so there has been I've I've noticed a lot of reticence to kind of embrace the the new wave of progressive politics which is coming into the party and in my experience this has produced some growing pains there are people who seem to have a, a different perspective or a different set of priorities and i would like to to speak on behalf of the caucus of course and personally um, i appreciate your time and answers today i think that they have been directly to some of the main issues that we have as caucus have had about your campaign. And, and I hope that if you're just watching this interview with Howie, that we have uh, addressed some of the issues that you might have regarding the campaign with transgender issues and things like that. Um, and I see that there's, <laughs> there's a question there. So um, you want to take that one? <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. Thank you, Margaret. Yep. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to move on to some other questions. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is from Tyler in North Dakota. He works for UPS, as I did, uh, until it's almost two years now. And uh, he says, we are experiencing economic fallout from coronavirus and oil prices plummeting. Most of these folks, I think he's talking about North Dakota, are clinging to Trump and fossil fuels as their savior. How can we help bring them to our side? Well, uh, first of all, I think we got to talk to these people about who Trump really is. He doesn't care about us. He only cares about himself. And if you get people to listen to what he's actually saying, like these coronavirus briefings, that becomes clear. He's not talking about how to protect us from coronavirus. He wants us to go back out and die for the Dow or for the oil industry. And uh, I think, you know, we just got to tell people what I tell people in upstate New York who support Trump is do you know he twice said, if you can't find a job here, you should move. He don't want to help us. He doesn't care about us. And you know, these Trumpies say, really? Did he say that? Yeah, he did twice. And uh, you know, I don't know what he said about North Dakota, but it's probably not been very helpful. Now, I think we can also talk to these people about uh, what we're campaigning for an economic bill of rights, a guarantee for a job, an income above poverty, affordable housing, comprehensive health care, lifelong public education, and a secure retirement. And that's a safety net for everybody. Now, with respect to people that's working in the oil industry, you know, our Eco-Socialist Green New Deal calls for a just transition for all workers out of industries that are phased out as we go to 100% clean energy over the next decade. And that just transition would provide up to five years wages and benefits that people were getting until they find comparable work or they retire and they come to retirement age. And there's plenty of work to do with this Green New Deal. The Eco-Socialist budget I put on uh, my website and it details how much we need to invest and how many jobs it will create. And between the Economic Bill of Rights, which is part of my Eco-Socialist Green New Deal and the Green Economy Reconstruction Program to get us to zero to negative greenhouse gas emissions and 100% clean energy by 2030, it creates 38 million jobs. Now, until this coronavirus depression hit, the bottleneck was labor. Well, the, the Equal Social Green New Deal is the way we get out of this coronavirus depression. Of course, first we have to have uh, national government invoke the Defense Production Act so that we're not only producing and distributing to where they're needed the medical supplies, but also the testing, contact tracing, and quarantining of infected individuals and those who are in contact with them so we can go safely back to work. So I think what you can tell people is, you know, we have real solutions to these problems and they should take a look at them because if they're, you know, waiting for the oil industry to come back, I mean, aside from coronavirus, the Saudis and the Russians have their own little spat and that was destroying the oil industry here in you know, plummeting oil prices before the coronavirus depression hit. So the oil industry is not going to be their savior and the coronavirus needs to be addressed. So I hope that helps you there in North Dakota. And uh, I hope you'll be in touch with us because getting on the ballot in North Dakota, we don't really have a green party there. We need people to pull something together and we're working on it. And uh, Tyler, you could help us. So the next question is, 
How should the U.S. address its housing needs in a more fair way? How should federal government mitigate the negative effects of local exclusionary land use policies? Well, I've always been an advocate of inclusionary zoning, which means that you have to develop uh, areas so that it includes uh, diverse uh, uses and there are not barriers to people based on class or race to reside and work in those areas. And so we've had a fair housing law since 1968 and it's not been enforced or enforced effectively so that we actually have greater economic class and racial segregation than we had in 1968. And that's a real problem. The main thrust of my housing policy is to guarantee everybody affordable housing with two measures. One is federal universal rent control, like the federal government did during World War II when they were devoting all the resources to building arms to defeat the fascist powers and nobody was building housing, prices were going up, so they, they had federal housing rent control. And the other thing is a Green New Deal public housing program. And Bernie Sanders and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez put a bill into Congress um, that would do that. It's the right direction, but it's not sufficient. What my Eagle Social Green New Deal uh, proposes is that we build 25 million units over the next decade. That's two and a half trillion dollars. And that will create enough units that if we set aside 40% for low income people, we will end the affordability crisis for low income people. Because right now there are nearly 10 million who cannot find, find affordable housing by the federal standard of 30% of income. And then the other 60% uh, would be for people of any income background. We should have mixed income housing so we're not increasing segregation. They do that in Europe. You have professionals, working class people, and poor people all living in the same developments. So that reduces segregation. So it's a civil rights program. It's an affordable housing program. It's obviously a jobs program. And we will build uh, housing that is uh, green. It would be powered by clean energy and we emphasize building materials that sequester carbon. So it's a climate program too. And I think you can build a real coalition around that. And that's how we can get uh, housing needs met in a more fair way. <clears throat> so next question, why aren't any of the major party candidates calling for cuts in the military budget? Well, the answer is obvious. They never do. They never have. The uh, Congress, uh, with a majority Democratic House gave more money to the Pentagon than even Trump asked for. We're spending more now than we were at the height of the Cold War in real dollars. And it's not about defending us, it's about feeding the military industrial complex. And we need a complete turnaround. We need to be the world's humanitarian superpower and make friends instead of enemies, instead of being the world's global military empire. I'm calling for a 75% cut in military spending bringing our troops home from these endless wars and over 800 foreign military bases and going back out with a global Green New Deal to help the global South leap over the fossil fuel age as they develop right into the solar age of the 21st century. And there's a lot we can do in that regard. So, you know, the reason the major parties don't do that is the arms industry and uh, all the you know, lobbyists and everything, they support those parties to give them more money in a bloated military budget. Next question, the federal tax credit for residential solar is being phased out. How do you plan to make residential solar and other consumer alternative energy and energy efficient products more affordable to individuals and families? Well, tax credits are fine, but you have to have income to get the credit. So that doesn't help everybody. What we need to do and we would do with the Eco Socialist Green New Deal is create economies of scale. I mean, right now, solar and wind are competitive with every other energy form. And if we remove the subsidies from the fossil fuels, they're cheaper. And so that's what we need to do, bring these to scale. And then we need to provide programs so that 
you know, installing solar and wind for your own dwelling requires a big upfront expense, as does, if say, you're going to do ground source uh, heat pumps. Um, but what we can do is have community solar, and we can have it financed upfront by the government and put in your utility bills so that you pay it off over time. So the government puts the money up front, the investment, you don't have to go to the bank and borrow it. And then you pay it off over time and you will be paying less over time than you will if you keep the current, you know, gas and heating fuel that you're now using as well as the electricity from nuclear power and coal plants and gas fire plants. So bringing it to scale, I think is the best thing we can do for consumers. And I'm not, you know, the tax credits we got should, should remain because some people are using them, but I think we need to bring it to a much more powerful program to scale because we want to get to 100% clean energy in a decade. Next question, what would you do, would you expend or who would you extend a presidential pardon to first? Mumia, Peltier, Assange, Snowden, or anyone else? Or would it all be at the same time? And how many days, weeks, or months would it take you to do so? I would do it the first day at the same time. There's a long list of people. I would pardon all the whistleblowers. I would pardon all the people being prosecuted under the Espionage Act, most of them whistleblowers. In Assange's case, he's a publisher. Uh, he wasn't doing espionage. And uh, Mumi Abu-Jamar, Leonard Piltair, and a lot of people whose names are not as well known, like these elderly Black Panthers who are no threat to public safety, even if they did do some things way back, you know, decades and decades ago. Uh, they should just be released on humanitarian grounds now particularly in this coronavirus crisis. People are sitting ducks in those close quarters in those prisons. We should let a lot of those people out. And in the case of Edward Snowden, I wouldn't just pardon him. I would bring him into my administration. I'd ask him because I like the way he tries to balance our privacy rights when we're talking about surveillance and the need for legitimate intelligence. Like knowing in November, and Trump got this information, at least it was, he had access to it. If he read his briefings, we don't know. Uh, that was gathered by the intelligence agencies. That's a legitimate purpose. So I think Snowden, I, his book, um, Permanent Record, I recommend everybody read it. It's both biographical and policy oriented, and it's a real page turner. And uh, that really impressed me about his approach to those issues. Next question, in 1944, FDR proposed the Economic Bill of Rights, which stated that things like the right to affordable housing, income, and et cetera, uh, do you stand for this and should it be ratified? Yeah, I've been campaigning for that as part of the Green New Deal since 2010. I, I was the first candidate in the country to campaign for a Green New Deal. In 2010, we're coming out of the Great Recession. So we actually led with our Green New Deal that year. I was running for governor of New York. Uh, with the Economic Bill of Rights, with the um, climate action being part of the economic stimulus. And climate back then was not the huge issue it is now, although we recognize it as such. In fact, when I ran that year, we should get to a, I said we should get to 100% clean energy by 2020, which is what the climate science carbon budget said rich countries like the United States should do. Now we're late, but the fastest we can do it, you know, according to the studies, is about a decade with a crash program. So we've got to do that. Um, so the thing about the Economic Bill of Rights is Roosevelt put it in his State of the Union addresses 1944 and 1945, acting Congress to enact the things they identified as uh, economic rights that everybody ought to have. And it kind of disappeared until the Civil Rights Movement picked it up and brought it to the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom the 1966 freedom budget in the 1968 poor people's campaign. And the thing they added that uh, was not in FDRs was it has to be applied in the program given without discrimination because the old new deal was as one author put it in a book called uh, when affirmative action was white, it was a segregated program. But for example, social security didn't originally cover agriculture and domestic workers who were predominantly Black in the South and Mexican-American in the Southwest. So that was one change. The other was they wanted a 
guaranteed income above poverty built into the tax structure. And that's something that Bernie Sanders' economic bill of rights didn't have. And I think that's crucial. Uh, they say poverty is hard to end. The problem poor people have is they don't have enough money. And most poor people are working hard. They just have low wages. So poverty is not a hard problem to solve. Most people, when they think of poverty, they think, oh, the problem's with the poor people. Most of them don't have a problem. Now, there are addicts, alcoholics, people with emotional issues. They need to be helped. But that's not the real problem of poverty. The problem is low wages. And uh, this guaranteed income above poverty would ensure that uh, if people are still on low wages, we want to live in wage, minimum wage of $20 an hour. But if they're working low wages, they get brought up above the poverty line. If they cannot work for whatever reason, uh, they're brought up above poverty. So I think that's an important part of this economic bill of rights. So as I said earlier, job guarantee, income guarantee, housing guarantee, universal health care through a single public payer, Medicare for all, uh, universal lifelong tuition-free public education from pre-K and child care through post-secondary colleges, universities, technical schools and continuing adult education, and then a secure retirement. And the quickest way to do that is a double social security benefits. There's been a proposal around for a decade. It's uh, not that hard to pay for. The first thing we do is lift the cap on the social security tax, which is now $130,900. You make more than that. Any dollar you make over that, you don't pay the social security tax. If those high incomes started paying, it would be a big boon to the social security funding. So next question, are you concerned at all about another four years of Trump? could look like for our planet. Yeah, I'm concerned. But I'll tell you, I'm also concerned what Biden will mean for the planet. Biden's so-called Green New Deal wants to keep burning fossil fuels and add on carbon sequestration technologies, which are not proven. He's for an all of the above energy policy, which means fracking the hell out of the country so we can continue to be the world's number one oil and gas producer. He wants to build nuclear power plants you know, when he was vice president, the federal government provided loan guarantees to the nukes they tried to build in South Carolina and Georgia. And all those nukes have gone belly up because of cost overruns and way past construction schedules. There's two left in Vogel, Georgia, that are having trouble. They haven't been canceled yet, but they should be. Um, so Biden is a, is a threat to the planet. You know, I like to say Trump calls... Uh, climate change a hoax, but the Democrats act as if it's a hoax. And Biden epitomizes that. So I'm scared about both of them. So what I'm saying is we need to vote for the only uh, campaign that'll be on the ballot in November, the Green Party campaign, which is for a serious, a full strength Green New Deal. And we may not win the office, but a big vote can leverage the politics and move the debate forward. And then sometimes I'm asked, what am I going to do my first 100 days in office? And I say, you know, more, more than likely I won't be in office. But what I'll be doing is organizing mass nonviolent direct action to push these issues forward. The Extinction Rebellion is talking about that. That's what Dr. King tried to do with the Poor People's Campaign. Sit in in Washington and cause disruption until they responded on that economic bill of rights. And I think that's where we got to go, whether it's Trump or Biden. And uh, so, yeah, Trump is a, is a menace, but but uh, Biden has no solutions. So next question, what in your opinion would be the best way for to expand the Green Party have, and alter the dual party system we are currently stuck in? Well, I actually just wrote a op-ed that I sent to the New York Times. We'll see if they publish it. And it's a response to Bill McKibben that said, I should get out of the race and the Green Party should abandon this race and work for instant runoff voting or ranked choice voting. And my answer to Bill McKibben is if we're not in the race, that issue won't even be raised. Biden has never raised it. None of the Democrats uh, running for the nomination raised the issue of a ranked choice national popular vote for president in place of the electoral college and it's the electoral college, not the Green Party, 
that elected losers like Donald Trump and George W. Bush to the presidency. They lost the popular vote, but the Electoral College put them in office. And you would think after 20 years, the Democrats have been whining about the Greens and knocking us off the ballot. You would think that they would deal with the real institutional reason why they won the popular vote and didn't get the presidency. Not Instead, they want to pick on the Greens, which is not a solution. So I want to make ranked choice voting an idea whose time has come. It will require a constitutional amendment to replace the Electoral College with a ranked choice national popular vote for president. And people say that's hard. Yeah, but look at the last amendment, the 27th Amendment. That amendment was part of James Madison's original 12 amendments to the Bill of Rights. And this one languished for 200 years. And then in the 80s, people got angry at Congress voting themselves raises because what this amendment does is say, you can't vote yourself a raise in your current term. And a college student wrote a paper at the University of Texas. He got a C because the professor said it'll never happen. And that student got mad. And without any money or any organization behind him, he started writing state legislators. And he, he the, the, the amendment swept through the states in the 80s, starting with Maine. And there used to be a saying back in the 1800s as Maine goes, so goes the nation because it was a bellwether for presidential elections. And Maine now has instant runoff voting or ranked choice voting for the presidential electors in this election. So let's make that statement ring true again. As Maine goes, so goes the nation. And I think this is an issue that ought to be debated and uh, it won't be if we leave it to Biden and Trump. So I'm told that's the end of the questions for tonight. And I appreciate everybody listening. Uh, we're told about 30 minutes is a good time for these. And I'm sure we'll be back on. I know there were hundreds of questions and we want to answer them. So, uh, you know, look for notice of a, another event. And I can't see y'all. This is different than Zoom, but uh, I wish I could. But it, uh, thank you for being here. And uh, I look forward to next time we can have uh, this question and answer session. Have a good evening.